pray for those that are watching the kids and teaching them something. If you don't agree with me on that, you should try teaching kids something. <laughs> they need prayer. Yeah, all, all the Sunday school teachers are like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> One thing about teaching, it, you know, you realize that, uh, like, in our school, we, I have 7th and 8th graders in the school I work with right now. And uh, there's, like, I don't know, 400 of them in the school. And somehow, by God's uh, great imagination, all 400 of them are different. You know, they all have different ways of communicating, uh, different ways of learning, and it all happens at once. So, you know, the, the bell rings and you got 400 people swarming in the hallways with all these personalities and everything. It, it's just amazing that it gets done every day. And trying to teach a group I'm, I'm blessed because I teach one at a time. So it's wonderful for me. But sometimes I have to substitute and stuff, and I, I get like 25 kids in the room. I'm trying to get a point across to 25 people at one time, kids, psh, really tough. So our Sunday school teachers, our groups who do that, I got nothing but respect. Uh, so prayer and spiritual growth is what we're gonna talk about today. Now this is February. <laughs> first Sunday in February, and, and sometimes like, sometimes we get ahead of ourselves, but this is the first one, and then we have one more, the next one is the 11th, and we're baptizing Fiona on the 11th, right? Amen. Okay, that's awesome, I'm very happy about that, I'm excited. So, we need to be in prayer for that event, come show up and show your support for her and her testimony. Um, just using her body as to our belief in Christ. That's fantastic stuff. But right after that, that's the 11th, 12, 13, 14, three days later, is Valentine's Day. And if you haven't started thinking about that yet, guys, you know, you're welcome. I just told you. You've got like a week and three days, okay? But, and, and, and like, love each other every day. I mean, you don't need a day for this. But, um, you know, whatever you do, love each other all the time. But I wanted to talk in honor of the day that's coming up a little bit about love. And if you look here and say, well, no, we're talking about prayer. Well, I think the biggest expression of love we can have is the gift of time. Spending time with each other is, I mean, just the best way to show you love somebody. Because, I mean, even if you look biblically, I think God places a lot more value on time than he does anything else. I mean, he recognizes in Scripture the, the value of, of riches and, and, you know, gold and jewels and all that kind of stuff. He recognizes those are there and they have value. But he really talks to us about what we do with our time. And that's a, really a reflection of love. And, and so those things that you love, you spend time with. Think about the, the passions you might have as a hobby, okay? You love doing that, so you spend time with it. If you love your spouse, spend time with them. If you love your God, spend time with him. That's really, it's all the same thing. We, we need to, like, build that in. And I'm not going to say that how much time you spend in prayer with God is a reflection of how much you love Him. But if you carefully read the scriptures, He might say that. <laughs> but think about this. Spend time with God. And so we're going to spend a little time looking at that today. So some of this breaking into now, prayer is all over the Bible, I'm front to back, it's just everywhere. So obviously I don't have time to cover all of that. I'm not even going to try to make this an exhaustive study of prayer. But just a few kind of key points, if you will, to kind of lead us maybe into a deeper prayer life. Um, well, let's take a look at the essence here of prayer, what it's about. In Colossians 4, 2, we are told to continue in prayer and watch in the same, watch in prayer with thanksgiving. So the, one of the basic parts of prayer, this is going to sound kind of simplistic, but to do it, Prayer isn't something that you can sit on a shelf. 
It's something that has to be part of our life. Continue in prayer. Talking to God. And, and sometimes there's this whole you know, conversation you have with God. But I think prayer also is a part of our uh, just acknowledgement of the presence of God with us everywhere, all the time. I mean, to, just think about what your day would look like if you spent your whole day, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is a chore, and if you take it on as a challenge, I would love that. Come talk to me about it. But think about taking your entire day, and all day long, you thoughtfully remember that God is with you. All day. Every minute. The presence of God in your life all the time. He is, but how many times do we go through our day and we're not thinking about that? Hey, I'm thinking sometimes, you know, the, the real holy roller kind of Christians among us maybe could say four or five, six times during the day, maybe they thought of God being with them. But how many could say, I've done it all day long, I knew of his presence with me consciously, not that I just intellectually think he's there, but I know he is with me, and I've thought about it all day. If you did that, would it change your life? I think so. I think so. Uh, another passage in the Bible tells us to be continuous in prayer. To pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean eyes closed going down the road. That would be a problem. But that's that constant awareness of God with me. I mean, prayer is nothing except being in the presence of God and, and being mindful of being in that and having that conversation or just having that quiet comfort of his presence. So that is one of the essences of prayer here is to continue in it and to give thanks. Um, secular psychologists admit to the fact that people who are thankful are happier than people who are not. God knew that. He, he builds thankfulness all through the Bible. Yeah, what is the greatest thing to be thankful for? That's our God. You know, and those things that, that come down from Him. Because every good and perfect gift comes from God. That's in the book too. So, to be thankful is also in the essence of what our prayers need to be. Every prayer should have thankfulness in it. And, and sometimes we think the thankfulness is something that's going to help God out. I, I thoroughly believe that God is as much God as he's ever going to be. We don't get to make him more God because of what we do. But you know what? When we are thankful to God, we get better. Y'all get that? When we confess our sins to God, we get better. We don't give him information. He knows you did it. But it's us agreeing with God that that was wrong and letting him forgive us for it. He stands ready to forgive. We just don't go for it. And, and so, I know that that's something to be thankful for. So I can go to God. You know, there are people out there that think they have to go through somebody else. And have somebody else pray for them. But our Bible tells us because of what Christ did, we can go directly to the throne of God in our prayers. Amen. There are people out there that will never know that freedom. But we have it. So continue in prayer and be thank you, thankful. Now, Psalms 145, 17 through 19 also says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. I'm going to stop there and say, yes. Yes, he is. So every time you think that God might have done something wrong, refer back to this. We see a lot of wrong out there. We see a lot of sin out there. That is not God's doing. That is because God gave man choice, and this is, this is what we do with choice. Look at the world around us. This is what humans do when they get to make their own choices. And they don't listen to God. But in his awesome sovereignty, he gives us the 
choice about whether or not to listen to him. But it says here that God is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Now, verse 18 says, The Lord is nigh or is close unto all those that call upon him, and to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. God is righteous. God is close. God will answer. And he will save us. How about that for our prayers? When you pray to God, know that he is righteous. That he is the one with absolutely the right decision about everything. That's who you get to talk to. I was talking with Julie this morning, I think, um, about you know, AI. And you know, I, I've got an app, and I talk to it sometimes. Just, just to see what it's going to say, you know? <laughs> And, you know, it's kind of like being able to just sit down and chat with the world's smartest person because it has access to all this information. And so that's pretty neat. But, you know, I can, I can text back and forth with the AI bot or whatever, but you know what I get to do with God? I get to talk with Him in my prayers. He is right. He is pure. He is holy. That's who I get to talk to. Not just smart, not just knowledgeable. He passionately cares about me and you. And we get to connect with that. The creator of the universe wants to talk to us. We should want to talk to him. And he promises to hear us. He promises to save us. Hey, there's a lot of wrong in the world. But in the middle of it, you and I can stand there and be right with God. We can be those individuals. I, I don't know if at any other time in history it is like it is now. Where the Christian can honestly be this beacon of light in the middle of the dark world around us. Holy cow. You will stand out if you live your life like a believer. You will stand out where people can point you out. If it ever gets to be illegal, you're all going to jail because you all stand out. And our sheriff will be with us. <laughs> but I don't know any of us that are going to back down, right? Amen. We believe what we believe. And wherever we believe it, God will take care of us. They can never take our salvation from us, no matter what they do. They also can never take prayer away from us. I, I've heard it said a lot of times since, you know, the 70s or whatever, that um, people took prayer out of school. Really, it's a little bit of a miscommunication. No edict from any government can take prayer out of anywhere. If I'm living and my brain's working, I can pray. I can pray in the school. I just have to keep my mouth shut, okay? And sometimes that's not a bad idea. <laughs> but prayer can be done anywhere. Our students can pray anytime they want to. Just maybe not out loud. They can discuss ideas openly with each other. They can ask questions about the Bible. I can ask questions all the time. And if they ask, I can answer. I'm gonna let you know something. Our school has, now all three of the schools that I have worked at um, recently, every one of them have Bible study groups of students. Every one of them. Voluntary gatherings where the students lead each other and they study the Bible. How about that? Amen. I know this, the press doesn't talk about that, but you know we have that all over our nation. Little pockets of people who are gathering together, studying their Bibles, talking to each other about it. They might not be in the majority. We, we, we may never be in the majority, but we are winners. I don't care how many are against us. We have God. And the fact that nobody 
ever can stop us from praying. I like that. So, understanding some of the essence there of prayer, let's talk about how we cultivate a habit of prayer. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. It says to be careful for nothing. Hang on, hang on, whoa, wait. You can fact check me on this one. Look in your Bibles on your own, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, any translation you want to, and it's going to come out with something like this right here. Be careful for nothing. God's telling me really not to worry about stuff? Yes, yes, he is. I want to ask you a question. This is a little theoretical because I don't, I, I've never experienced this, but let, let's say you have more money than you could ever, ever spend. Would you worry about the bills? No. It's a done deal, right? I got the money for this. I'm not worried about this. Would you worry about your car payment? No. Insurance? No. Because, you know, it's just coming out of this huge stockpile I have. Don't worry about anything, right? Because so financially, you wouldn't have a worry in the world. Except maybe keeping people from stealing the big stockpile we have. But even better than that, you have a relationship with God, the creator of everything, the one who loves you, who sustains you, the one who has given you eternal life, who at the end of it all owns everything, what do you have left to worry about? I mean, sometimes, I mean, we have to plan on how to get things done, because we don't have that big stockpile sometimes. But I've got to tell you, if you're worried about eating, talk to somebody in this church will feed you. I mean, if you've got these big worries that some people have, don't sit on them. Let somebody know so you get help. I mean, Sue has uh, mentioned it lots of times. We have so many different coaching ministries that we can tie you into if you have need help with something. We've got mental health stuff. We've got literacy stuff. We've got all kinds of things. Our outreach team is, is doing stuff with people. If you just need some, some help that way, talk to somebody. But recognize this. You have, are tapped into, in prayer, the creator of everything, the one who owns everything, and has promised to take care of you. Does that mean life never hurts? No. Life hurt for Jesus, okay? And if it hurt for him, I have no right to expect any different. I mean, he laid outside on a rock, okay? I got a bed. I'm already doing better. Man, I got a bed and a house to live in. I'm doing better than most of the world if you put it all together. I was reading a stat the other day that I, I think it said that the poorest of us here in our country are doing better than over 50% of the world. And we don't realize that we sit around fussing and worrying all the time. God says be careful for nothing. Let nothing bind you up in worry, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. So I want you to look at verse 7. This is important. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. So this ultimate peace is going to keep our hearts and our minds through Christ. So how do we attain this ultimate peace? First, you have to be a child of God, because None of this stuff works without that. It's like thinking you're going to go to a baseball game and just run into third base. No. You have to start it first. You've got to be saved. you got to ask Jesus to be your Savior. That's first base. Because nothing else matters until that happens. But after that happens, check this out. We can have this ultimate peace that nobody can even understand or explain that will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. How do we get there? The Bible doesn't leave you hanging. That's what verse 6 is for. We get there by not being anxious and worryful, but by bringing things to God in prayer. 
the more you want to worry about something should be the more that you pray about something. I mean, we got a word yesterday. My, my brother was in the uh, emergency room. We didn't know what was going on with him. We could have worried about him. Instead, we prayed for him. You know, take that stuff that you are carrying, give it to the one who can carry it better, and give it to God. When we do that, when we give thanks to him, we let him know what's bugging us and what's going on, we ask for forgiveness because our sins are going to wear us down. And we get better when we do that. When we do those things, you're going to have peace. What is there to worry about if I trust God? How do you get to have a habit of that? Well, think about it. Commit to yourself. Every time I'm going to worry about something, I'm going to pray instead. You're going to develop a habit of prayer. Every time I'm concerned about something, I'm going to pray about it. That's going to build up a habit of prayer, isn't it? Don't you guys carry concerns around every now and then? Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Worry? Pray. Concern? Pray. Happy? Pray. Thankful? Pray. See? That's how we get a habit of prayer. You keep doing that, every one of these feelings that you get, you turn around and you talk to God about it, and before long, we're back to that point where all day long, you recognize God is with you. Let's face it, all day long, something's going to concern you, worry you, uh, hit you, make you happy, make you sad, something that you can talk to God about. And you'll be thinking about His presence more and more. And the more you do that, the better you are. God is still God. You don't make him better, but it makes you better. So that's going to be a habit of it. Now, let's talk about spiritual barriers. James 4, 7 through 10. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter return to the morning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. It doesn't mean that we can never be happy. Let's get happy about the right stuff. <coughs> Let's let our sins mean something. Let them bother you enough to come to God with them so that he can lift you up. Get, get down on your knees with God. Even, I mean, there's a abstract thought in your heart, or physically, whatever he leads you to do. But get there, humble yourself, and let him pick you up from that place and carry you on. Don't beat yourself with stuff, but like I said, you recognize it, you deal with it in prayer before God, and look what he does. How He, he tells you to purify your hearts and cleanse your hands. How do you do that? In prayer to him, by being humble. As you are humble, he will cleanse you, and he will purify you. Submit to God. See, a lot of people just read that word, resist the devil, and he will flee. A lot of people like grab that one out, you know, put on a sign, whatever. There's a first part to that. Part A is to submit yourselves to God. Having submitted yourselves to God, when those temptations and things come upon you, when the devil comes to like tear you apart, whenever that evil thing comes to you, having already submitted yourself to God daily in prayer, or daily in Bible study, and you are ready to resist that. And you won't have any choice but to go run on to somebody else. Now, how long does, of a resisting do you have to do? I don't know. See, some people think, okay, uh, I resisted the devil today, so I'm good for a while. <laughs> Not necessarily, guys. <coughs> You may have to resist for a long time before he flees. Because our enemy is a little bit persistent. And there's no time frame built in here. But know this. As you resist him and submit yourselves to God, you will win. Draw close to God. You feel an attack? Get as close to God as you can get. You know, my dog... That new one that came and adopted us. You know, I'm used to a husky. He sits on his couch. He looks at me like, yo, what up? And it's all good. This new one, every time he comes in the door, if he's been out in the yard for five minutes, he comes back in, he has to be in my lap. 
This is fifty pounds of dog. He has to be in my lap, and that's not even enough. He lays up against me, and, then, and he's doing that. And he starts pushing into me. This, this dude would get inside my shirt if he could. I mean, that's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about with God. I want to be so close to Him that I'm just pushing up against. I want to lay myself down in the comfort of God's arms. I want to know he's wrapped me up and he's protecting me. When Jesus talked about that picture of a, a mother hen gathering her young and protecting them, that's what I want. I want that refuge. I want it during those attacks. I want it in the good times. I want it in the bad times. That's how we're going to overcome spiritual barriers. Run to God. Praying for others is a big part of our prayer life. It should be. I, again, just looking at secular uh, materials. People, <clears throat> people who pray for others. I mean, we're not even talking about Christians, okay? I'm just, psychological. Folks that are sending positive thoughts. All these other things some people might do, right? But all these times that people are intentionally thinking about the good of others, they're happier people than the people that don't. How much more if we add the spirit of our holy God into the mix with that psychology? So as we pray for others, we get better. Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So not just that we are praying and giving our concerns to God, but we watch our brothers and sisters and we pray for them too. James 5, 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We probably don't sit around and confess our sins to each other. Some of us would be like, mm, not past, no, okay. But what are you concerned about? What's wrapping your heart up right now? What's got you tore up? Talk to somebody about it. And together, both of you talk to God about it. Get somebody to pray for you. Even if you keep it all vague and everything, have somebody praying for you while you're praying for you too. Don't give up your prayer life, but include people in it. Let's face it, guys. How can people know to pray for you if you don't tell them? So praying for others is a vital part. I mean, we, we handle the, the life that we have between us and God, and then we just reach that prayer out to everybody else in God, too, and draw them in. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, on when to pray. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. We talked about this. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What is God's will for you? I've heard people tell me before, I don't know what God's will is for my life. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. This is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Christ Jesus concerning you. One is rejoice. What's God for, will for you? Rejoice. Rejoice in the fact you know him. You're saved. Your eternity is secure. Start plugging in things. You can rejoice for all kinds of stuff. I don't care what's going on in your life. There are always things to rejoice about. And the more you rejoice, the less problems you actually feel you have. You can turn around and tackle those problems better now. They're not big, huge beasts anymore. Because you've got God. Rejoice always. This is God's will. Pray without ceasing. This is God's will.